The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Depending on where you are in the world, that'll sound just about right. We're going to get started here in about two minutes. I've got uh, 1058 local time here in Cleveland, working out of the home office, as I assume most of you are. Um, as we get started here, you know, we typically uh, kick things off by you guys letting me know where you're dialing in from. So if you could do that, that'd be awesome. And then also let me know if you're working from home or from the office. I'm curious to know who's still left in the office. I know some of us are um, critical personnel to the to the organization. But if you don't mind using the chat room to let me know, that would be terrific. And uh, I'll spread the word and give you some props and shout outs as we go. I uh, had some really uh, distant folks last week, uh, hoping for a similar turnout this week. And thanks to all of you for logging in early. We're about uh, a minute away from getting going here, so keep those chats coming through, and I'll collect some info and share it with everyone as we go on here. All right, thanks for keeping those flowing. Um, looks like the majority of our folks are, are working from home here. Um, we've got, um, let's see, Denver. We've got Fort Lauderdale, Philadelphia, Boston, Seattle. We've got uh, Mexico, the UK, Spain. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Keep these all coming through. I haven't seen anyone say they're working from the office yet, so that's very interesting. I would assume some of you are. Maybe you're too shy to chat through, but keep those responses coming in the chat room. For those of you just logging in, if you don't mind, let me know where you're dialing in from and whether you're working from the, the home office or your um, normal offices. Uh, that would be great. We're going to go ahead and get started, and before I hand the controls over to uh, to Chris, we'll go through some notes here. Uh, we've got a really great webinar topic for you all today, a new one for us, and that's understanding the basics of RF hardware and functions. And with me today is Mr. Chris Minton, and I think he was with me last week as well. Is that right, Chris? Yes, sir. Good to be back. How are you? It's good to have you back. And um, I assume you are working from your home office as well today in Texas? I sure am. Sure. Well, good. Uh, keeping everybody safe and sound. Um, some quick updates here before we get going with the show. Um, we do remain committed to you uh, as evidenced by today's webinar. We'll keep these going uh, every week. Um, so for those of you who are, are working from home and, uh, you know, some of us, it's even better working from home because there's less distractions. Now, in my case, I've got a three and a four year old at home with me. So maybe my uh, distractions increased a bit, um, but um, we are going to keep our doors open, keep everything going from a, a webinar perspective, uh, from a support perspective. We have implemented a work from home policy, as I'm sure many of you on the line have as well. Um, so uh, we don't anticipate any interruptions there. Uh, so please contact your account manager should you run into any issues, or you can always, of course, email support at sevensignal.com for those of you who are customers. Um, as you would expect, working with our sales team has changed a little bit. You know, we have implemented a, a firm no travel policy, both internationally and locally. So our meetings will be transitioned from in person to online. So keep that in mind, as I'm sure uh, your company has implemented a similar policy. Uh, from a product development standpoint, we don't anticipate any changes there as well. Uh, our customers are going to continue to enjoy those monthly updates and upgrades to the software um, through our agile development uh, because we are software as a service, so we remain pretty agile there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, from a shipping perspective for our hardware sensors, we don't expect any delays there. Um, so uh, our inventory remains high, even though we do source our parts globally. Um, so for those of you ordering Sapphire sensors, um, we don't expect any hiccups there. 
And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned every week um, today, we, we won't go into a product demo. Uh, we'll talk about some products from a high level perspective and maybe how they play into today's topic. But if you do want a full product tour, uh, simply go to go.sevensignal.com forward slash tour. Uh, and we have a weekly uh, every Friday webinar that we put on. There's no sales spin or marketing pitch. Uh, it's just a heavy duty product tour. Uh, and with our new releases last week, around uh, Sapphire Eye and our new dark user interface and some other uh, enhancements. There's a lot to see. So if you haven't been with us lately or seen a product tour, uh, please join us this Friday and, and we'll get one out to you. So uh, a little bit about 7Signal for those of you who are new to the group. Um, we were founded in 2007 uh, in Helsinki, moved the company to the US in 2010 in search of new Wi-Fi talent. Um, we continue to grow as an organization over 200 customers, over 30 partners around the world that are bringing our products and services to our customers. 13 patents that expand across both of our products, Sapphire Eye and Mobileye. We manage over 5 million devices on a daily basis, and that crunches a lot of numbers. It equates to over a billion data points that we analyze da daily. We're certified with our hardware in over 40 countries around the world, and we are GDPR compliant. So not only do we stay relevant with our technology stack, we care about privacy, and that is evidenced by our GDPR compliance. Um, and we continue to grow. So 7Signal is here uh, to enable the wireless world. And what we're doing is we're helping our customers find and fix Wi-Fi issues. We created an outside-in enterprise framework uh, since 2007 that's completely AP and device agnostic and modular. So depending on what your challenges are, uh, we will have a solution to fit your exact needs. All of our software uh, helps our customers be proactive uh, with reports and alerting and full analytics. And what we're looking for are what we call the top seven Wi-Fi problems. Everything that has to do with a challenge in the world of Wi-Fi bubbles up to one of these seven challenges. Congestion coverage, co-channel radio interference, network services, roaming, adapters and drivers, and wireless LAN configuration. And how we do it is we're using our software and hardware to run active and passive tests on your network for things like throughput packet loss, latency and jitter, MOS scores, looking at those adapters and drivers, giving you a full spectrum analysis of all the interference in the air around your network. All, again, completely device and AP agnostic. Um, and it's important since we've created that outside-in framework that you understand what the legacy environment is. And for those of you who aren't 7Signal customers, you live this every day, right? You're, um, you're, you're challenged to understand what's going on in your access points, your controllers, all of your devices from the manufacturer. Uh, and that's all well and good. They have great diagnostics and we're here to complement those, but they don't have visibility into the end user experience like we have. Seven Signal lives on the edge, in the air, on the device, up in the rafters with your access points. Um, so giving you a perspective that you just can't get from anywhere else, giving you that root cause analysis in seconds, what normally took days or hours to, to get to the bottom of, we can go back in time and look at any given time over the last uh, 30, 60, 90 days at a device, at a network, at a floor, at an access point, uh, and tell you exactly what was going on uh, so you can get right to the uh, meat and potatoes of those issues and stop chasing ghosts. Uh, we've got two modules that are part of the 7Signal platform, Mobileye, which is our device agnostic um, uh, application that lives on the device itself, uh, Windows, Mac, Android devices, 100% software base, looking for these five challenges, adapters and drivers, roaming issues, adjacent and co-channel interference, coverage and congestion. And Sapphire Eye is our software-enabled hardware. It's a sensor or a perfect client that lives up in the uh, rafters with the access points. It is a software subscription as well, even though we do have a hardware component, we do not charge for it. Um, and it gives you the full spectrum analysis. So any of your network services, your wireless LAN configuration, your radio frequency and co-channel interference and coverage. So some real differentiation between the two products. Um, they are not alike, they look for different uh, issues. So depending on what your challenges are, uh, we are the only vendor in the space to offer this complete suite. Uh, and again, all patented uh, part of our uh, offering for you. 
So with that said, uh, not too much marketing spin. Um, wanted to get you to the uh, the reason why you're all here, and that is to listen to Chris, uh, to Chris Minton, and he is going to give us his uh, presentation today. So I'm making you the presenter, Chris, so you'll be able to pull up your screen. And I'm going to, while you're pulling up your screen, I'll go back into the chat and see if there are any uh, folks who are not working from home. If you guys didn't uh, have a chance to use the chat window to let us know where you're dialing in from. We'd appreciate it. Uh, I mentioned about a dozen or so cities previously. And uh, it doesn't look like anyone is working from the home office, or excuse me, from an office. It looks like everyone's working from their home environment. So if you're uh, different than that group, uh, ping me and let me know. I'm kind of curious. So it looks like 100% of us are, are working from our home offices today. So uh, Chris, with that said, uh, the, the controls are yours. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Don. Uh, can you hear me okay? And can you see my screen? I see your screen and I hear you okay. You're on the Seven Signal Modulars page and now you're we're looking at your bio. Hey, great. So, Don, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with everybody today. Uh, guys, uh, thank you for the time. Uh, we've got 20 minutes, uh, so we're going to go you know, pretty quick, uh, but I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Uh, so, about me, uh, it's hard to believe, but 22 years and going as a network engineer. Um, you know, starting at the bottom of my career uh, when I first started after college, um, started at Abilene Regional Medical Center, and um, I'm proud to say that my first wage is, was $11.25 an hour, and I thought I was the richest person for doing what I what I love. So that was uh, off to the start. Uh, worked there uh, with uh, as a network admin, and, and you know, worked into the bottom end as well, and then spent most of my time. Uh, non-sales at, at Accenture and the state of Texas, uh, you know, working in network, set, security ops, voice over IP, uh, and wireless. And then uh, the, the career really started with sales uh, with Sonical and Fortinet, Mojo. Uh, Dell was interesting because I, I went to Dell to learn the client side, uh, selling their high-end precisions and rugged uh, devices, and it, especially when it comes to cloud and software as a service, and especially wireless, uh, the client has a lot of, say, a lot of decisions in how you know, Wi-Fi actually behaves. Uh, and then I've been uh, working with Seven Signal, it's a great company, and just enjoying every second of it. Uh, so I'm, I was off Twitter for a long time. Uh, I've just hopped back on Twitter, uh, noticed uh, from Dodge recommendations and Jim, uh, about our solutions uh, director of engineering. Uh, that there is a lot of great Wi-Fi information on Twitter. Uh, it's made me find Twitter again, so I'm there uh, following uh, you guys and learning just as much. So uh, get started today. I want to cover some of the topics that we're going to go over. And that, again, is a very quick history of the Wi-Fi design. Uh, I think it's very important to know, you know who makes your Wi-Fi hardware, uh, to go into the differences between clients and access point Wi-Fi hardware. And, the big reason to look at this in this order is to show some of the differences about you know Wi-Fi 6 and what we have now going forward. So as all great things uh, that have, were born, uh, Wi-Fi was actually born in the 70s in Hawaii. So uh, you know I don't know if it's the waves or, or radio frequency waves, but uh, it was all like good thing. 70s in Hawaii, that's actually when Wi-Fi first got its its start, uh, and and. 85, uh, they you know, realized that there was this small band uh, that they could let people play in, uh, maybe in the Fed, uh, you know, that they decided to let to be unlicensed, uh, which you know, was good for the Fed because it didn't go very far. Uh, so it is amazing uh, all these years later, what we as wireless engineers and vendors have been able to do with just a uh, you know, short spectrum of what we can, we can express with it. Uh, so these are, these are key dates. These aren't these aren't absolutely everything. But I think these are the ones that really got Wi-Fi moving. Uh, of course, in '91, they found a way to monetize it and find an actual application uh, to use. And then my favorite is in '92, where we actually have a Wi-Fi. Uh, so you notice I have it here in bold. Uh, a failed experiment to detect exploding many black holes the size of an atomic particle. That's actually. Uh, is in the Wi-Fi that we use today. That's actually what they use for Wi-Fi path. So when somebody says that Wi-Fi isn't difficult, you can always say, hey, you know, it started with uh, with astrophysics. So I always think that's pretty pretty exciting. And then 97 is when the actual standard was ratified. And of course, from 97 to 2020, a uh, whole bunch of improvements that actually should be in 
bold letters, you know, radio, radio bands, uh, MIMO, uh, DOE requirements, and not even talking about what we have with location, cloud SaaS controller, uh, you name it. So it's uh, it's been a, a really interesting ride for a very young uh, protocol. So Wi-Fi being so young, uh, it really never had a chance to be built by its, its, its own vendors. And as you guys probably know, and if you don't, that's uh, in the model that we're in today, uh, most vendors, uh, vendors actually people that actually stamp products and they sell it, uh, Cisco, Aruba, uh, SonicWall, Arista, you name it, uh, their silicone is actually made by, by someone else and it's, it's called Foundry. Uh, and this started in 87, uh, started a revolution in the market. And what I have here on the right is from 2017 is the top, uh, producers of Wi-Fi components uh, uh, by rank. And then on the left, which is in the references, uh, all of this information, we uh, have all the references for you at the end. Uh, it's actually a living document on the internet that actually shows <clears throat> what Wi-Fi uh, semicom vendors are still around and actually what's, what they make. Uh, so there are companies that still make async chipsets, async acronym for application specific integrated circuits. Uh, but most most customers today and most vendors today, they have their builds, they design it, uh, AutoCAD, engineering, you know, all of those designs, uh, and then they send it off to these factories to to be monitored, uh, to be to be to be made and monitored with a, a supply chain. Uh, it's very very in detail, very in depth. Uh, but that's where all of our Wi-Fi is coming. Location is mostly China and Taiwan, where this is this is being made. And what I wanted to show you guys is that we're going to focus on uh, RF hardware. And I want to focus on the most common type of wireless access point, uh, not because it is the uh, best or the most sold, it's because it's the most aesthetically pleasing. Uh, Seven Signal is in, the, in our sapphire rooms, our analyzers are the same way. It is the indoor internal omnidirectional access point. Uh, those are the majority, those are the line share. Uh, and what we have to the right is actually a block diagram from Texas Instruments, uh, again, which you can reference here in a little bit, that uh, shows what a access point uh, looks like from a block diagram perspective. And you can see up to the left, we start with power. Uh, we start with, uh, I'm going to see if I can move my corner here. I have a little problem moving my corner, so bear with me. Um, and I've, I've got a white so, screen, uh, Chris. Okay, let me fix that. There you go. You can see your slide. I'm just, just going to do main screen. How's that? Can you see? Yeah, I can see your uh, diagram. Perfect. Okay, so in this block diagram, this is what an access point looks like, but it is actually flattened. Uh, in reality, you can see here in a second, uh, these are actually layered on top of each other. Uh, so you have your general components, uh, your CPU, flash, uh, memory, you've got your power requirements. Again, this website is really interesting because uh, in the TI block diagram, you can actually click in here, like this is red highlight, and actually shows you all your options that you can that you can make. So you see your console port, you have the options here, you know, a nice little flow chart for logistics. And then over time, uh, you're noticing, you know, very uh, high, high, high powered uh, giving at Ethernet ports. Uh, and then also we're starting to see a BLE with antennas, with our Wi Fi. Uh, again, uh, all of this uh, crammed into an actual access point. So in design, let's look at this. So what we have here is a teardown of the HP 516. And the main thing I wanted to show about hardware design, especially when it comes to access points, is if you go back to the diagram, it doesn't look anything like the blonde diagram. Uh, we do this with all the access points that I have. Once they go old, if they do belong to me, uh, I actually take them apart um, with no hope of ever putting them back together just to see how they, they work. Uh, sometimes I'll put them back together just to make sure I can still, you know, still got it. Um, but uh, I always like to see what's what's inside. And this is, again, an omnidirectional in, indoor access point. Uh, you'll notice the antenna, and then you'll notice that underneath it, we've got the actual, uh, the, the back plane, uh, the radios here, uh, and then actually the antennas here, the ground here. What's really interesting 
about the access point and this design is this little gray piece of, of uh, backing uh, right here. And apologize for that, my mouse just kind of seems to disappear. And I know we're having some global uh, go to meetings. I'm um, hopeful that's not what it is. So it's just a, a little error on my part. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, what we have omnidirectional is that the access point is on the ceiling, obviously. But the Wi Fi, the antennas are actually pointed down. And the reason of this backing right here is because if you think about omnidirectional antennas, and the ray and how they actually radiate, uh, it's like a balloon. And he wants that signal to actually go down. So having something in the back of these antenna actually stops that. And if we look at a little bit uh, more advanced model, this is the NIST 41E e for external, uh, you'll notice that actually, again, this is three dimensional. So this is in uh, 3D space. So this is the top layer after the list is taken off. And then here is the metal. Uh, external for the dipole antennas, and you're noticing that. So think of it as putting uh, a piece of aluminum foil um, on one side of the light bulb. Uh, you're actually trying to push that signal to, to go straight down. And that's what you see in this most common uh, AP design. Uh, you'll notice uh, in the middle of that, that uh, those are uh, Bluetooth antenna. And also, this MIPS actually has a little bit more functionality than the other one we talked about. So you can see that there's actually three videos, uh, a little bit harder processing. Uh, and then we go into something like this, which is the Cisco wireless access point, the 4800. <laughs> this thing is uh, is a beast. <laughs> and as they come, they start to get a lot heavier, actually weight. They take up a lot of power requirements. Uh, I just wanted to point out here, uh, hyperlocation. So this is something that, uh, that we're doing in Wi-Fi. Uh, and you'll notice here there's uh, a Bluetooth antenna with these hyperlocation. There's actually 16 antennas for precise location. Uh, again, you know, we talked about this in another series about the business applications for that. Uh, but many, many antenna. And again, there's that metal plate trying to push that uh, that that strength, that radio, that power uh, straight uh, straight down. And then also underneath that is where you're going to find all. The, uh, what you would expect, the CPU, the radios uh, connected to the to the merchant silicon. So now I wanted to move to the actual client. Uh, working at Dell for the, you know, for you know, several years, uh, got to learn a lot about. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I learned a lot about the requirements for designing client devices, especially consumer versus uh, enterprise, uh, and then also uh, tablets, two-in-ones, convertibles. Uh, we've hit uh, Moore's Law when it, when it comes to CPU design, and the batteries uh, and the power that needs to you know, make these devices work at the level they need, especially with the network interface card, uh, it's very it's a trade-off on the device versus the device's aesthetic and how it how it looks and how heavy it is compared to what you can get inside it. Now, people are doing things. People like uh, vendors are doing things with the, the screens of your laptops. The screens uh, actually have low low energy, uh, actually have high display, low energy. Uh, they're actually the processors now. Um, they're actually really working on trying to get more. Uh, things done with, with actually less power draw. Uh, and that affects the network interface card. And if you can see here on the left, that is the new Intel's uh, Wi-Fi 6 uh, daughter card for, <clears throat> for devices. And then to the right, uh, we have a simple block variable with Qualcomm PCI network interface card. Uh, a lot more space uh, to connect to. You can also offload quite a bit of the services onto the main plane, same as, as with the daughter as well. And the net of this is that the design uh, is really specific uh, to the actual client. And as more and more clients come into your network, uh, you, you, you need to think about, especially when it comes to AX and Wi-Fi 6, you know, these devices coming in, you know, are they gonna be you know, capable uh, of these speeds? And we're also gonna talk a little bit about you know, capable versus certified. Uh, which is a you know, thing I like to check um, when you're talking to my clients. But as you guys know, the client actually does a lot of the decision-making in Wi-Fi. 
And then the clients uh, is actually very different in the restraints of the net uh, to be able to connect at different speeds. Uh, and this is going to be a challenge and a trade-off going forward, especially enterprise enterprise devices uh, you know, and going forward. Right? So that brings me to uh, what's the differences in the Wi-Fi 6 hardware and what we have now. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but right here, uh, I, I think the two biggest factors of, of what's causing you know, people to not you know, completely just start producing all sorts of Wi-Fi 6 for these two requirements. Um, the OCMA, uh, you know, with the data rate increase, uh, it's, it's quite, quite amazing uh, right here. Uh, that takes quite a bit of processing power. And then again, this takes a lot of signaling strength, and a lot of radio technology with the, um, the multi-user multiple and multiple out connections. Again, there's some other nice little categories of enhancements for, for Wi-Fi 6, uh, especially uh, VSS coloring, which that's going to be really interesting if we can actually, in a nutshell, the APs are going to be able to tell people, hey, you don't have to be so loud, turn it down a little bit, you got a guaranteed connection at this rate. Uh, but the way that they do the division here for the efficiency is, is what's, uh, this is the big, I think, most gains in, in Wi-Fi 6. So that comes into hardware. So uh, I get these questions quite a bit about you know, how, uh, what's different in the hardware. And the net of it is, is that you know, it's right here, there's more radio chains to support more spatial streams, you know, six gigahertz radios, gotta have those, obviously. Uh, and then these devices actually take quite a bit more power. Uh, so, and especially with PoE, you've got to look at these access points and make sure that your switches, if you are handling PoE, are actually up to the uh, PoE requirements uh, that they have. And then a lot of these backend connections, these devices are running multi-gig Ethernet connections. So what I've shown here below is a print screen of the Wi-Fi Alliance or Wi-Fi Org, uh, who is certified in Wi-Fi 6. And the first thing that they've said is to fully benefit from the features of Wi-Fi 6. And again, this is something that you can go and you know, talk to your you know, peers, talk to your people that are interested in Wi-Fi 6, is that both the AP and the client device or the two peer full connected devices can be certified for Wi-Fi 6. Now, there's two different uh, Wi-Fi 6 right now. There is, if you look at some products, um, they say that they, in the marketing, in the first in paragraph or so, they'll say that it's Wi-Fi 6. We'll even have the, the AOC 11 uh, AX standard written, written right next to it. Uh, but then you go and you look at the actual product, and it says Wi-Fi 6 capable. And in my research, it's these back and goes to these first two things about what is the difference between what's certified and what's capable. Uh, some vendors uh, are going to push a update at a future date uh, that will get up to the speeds that are at the requirements uh, for this. Uh, and then some of them are actually fully certified. So what I like to do when I'm talking to my customers and we talk about the Wi-Fi you know, 6 and you know, when you're going to move to it, when you get certified, you're looking for it, is I actually like to go and look at this look at this spreadsheet or excuse me, this, this website and simply have a look to see who's actually Wi-Fi 6 certified. And then I'll go back and look at what vendors that we're looking at uh, and you know, see again where they are you know, saying that they are Wi-Fi 6 cert certified or compatible. If you are you know, looking at somebody who's Wi-Fi 6 compatible, it's really important that you really understand what, what that means. And what it's going to take uh, to, to get to that actual certification uh, for that vendor. Uh, it, it's both on the client side. Again, you can look at clients, wireless next on this page as well, and it'll tell you who's certified and who's not. Uh, but the access points, you know, again, if you're certified, you know, that means that you're, you know, is, you are good to go. Uh, compatible is one of those things that you want to, you know, going to want to research and dig in. And I fully understand what that means. Uh, sometimes that's very difficult uh, to get all of that information. Uh, it might take a while, but it is definitely worth it if you can you know, get ahead of it. And then again, look at your client environment. Uh, it's not just one Wi-Fi client device that's all now. It's uh, many different types of devices, many different types of vendors, uh, even again, same virtual silicon made by the same companies. Uh, but very different uh, results and capabilities from those clients. 
So I've listed all my references here, um, just to, you know, for, we'll have this uh, up online as well for some, some, some great uh, follow-up and some research for you guys as well. Uh, but that was the main you know, point of the day was just to focus on the access points for the internal uh, Omni Array uh, antennas and how they look compared to the clients and what you can expect with flight by six. Great, thanks, Chris. I'm gonna... <clears throat> I, uh, if you can hand me back controls, or I'll take those back here. We'll uh, start some Q and A as we always do here um, while we're transitioning, but. Uh, uh, please use the question pane uh, to ask us questions. You're talking about uh, RF today and hardware, but uh, it really, we can answer any of your questions, whether they're Wi-Fi related or not. And interestingly, uh, next week we will have uh, a webinar geared to home Wi-Fi. So a lot of you have changed your focus from internal Wi-Fi monitoring and troubleshooting to troubleshooting if, uh, your now remote workforces uh, home Wi-Fi and their home devices. So next week's topic is going to cover uh, a lot of your new pains as they relate to your day-to-day. -day. So stay tuned for an invite uh, for that webinar. Uh, and in addition uh, to uh, today's follow-up that you normally get from us with the recording, we're going to send you a survey out um, to solicit your feedback for topics, um, presenter feedback, that kind of fun stuff. So um, please give us your feedback. We love to, to improve constantly, um, not only with our product and support from an internal perspective, but also the outreach and, and these best practices webinar, which we're getting so much great feedback on. So um, thanks for joining us as usual. Um, so I'm skimming through here. I, I did get a lot of feedback uh, from different folks. Um, different cities that they're dialing in from. Rochester is a new one, South Africa, France, Green Bay, Bloomington. Thanks very much guys for uh, and girls for uh, sending us your feedback, uh, but still no one that said they're working from their uh, office. So very, very interesting. Um, some questions around getting a copy of today's slides, a recording of the presentation. Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, we will send those out. I'm happy to, to share uh, both the feedback and the presentation itself. Uh, and again, uh, had some requests for product demos. Uh, so uh, we don't get into too many product demos on these weekly webinars. If you would like some more information about our products, uh, like to see a tour uh, with no sales reps or no marketing spin, you can go to go.7signal.com forward slash tour. We have a, a live webinar this coming Friday at noon, uh, and it will showcase our new uh, dark UI that's part of our Sapphire product. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and uh, just got another message from folks uh, working from home. They keep coming in here. Raj from London, working from home. Uh, see, do you suggest we go to Wi-Fi 6 as we have a wide 2.55 gigahertz Wi-Fi already? Any thoughts there, Chris? Uh, I suggest uh, no. <laughs> um, again, you can do the channel. Vision as Wi-Fi 6 enables, but uh, we do a uh, review of the client capabilities and make sure that your clients are Wi-Fi 6 um, capable and actually certified. Um, if those, uh, all three of those are together, then absolutely, yeah. And, and let us know how, how things are, are going. We're, we're watching some of our customers as well uh, start that journey. Yeah, and that's, that's really important uh, to make sure that your devices are ready and your infrastructure actually needs to go Wi-Fi 6. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Going through, many thanks. Understand totally. Appreciate that. Uh, and Chris, I think that was our last question for today. So I think you're off the hot seat. Uh, great presentation. Um, folks, thanks for joining us today. We'll get you a copy of the recordings out. Um, appreciate your time today, and we'll see you next week again. Uh, home Wi-Fi troubleshooting next week and uh, remote devices and that kind of fun stuff. Thanks very much for joining us.